Hey, I'm John. Welcome to The Last Tuesday Show for September 2020. I think you're going to like the things that I've got lined up for this month. I'm going to start off with a quick demonstration of some useful metallic effects that you can work just about anywhere on any model. And then I'm going to do a little bit of a deep thoughts kind of thing. I've been thinking again, so we'll see what that came up with. Uh, a little bit of a show and tell of a model I recently finished. Got a couple of uh, questions that I'm going to answer that have come in over the last month. And finally, what I'm really excited to share with you is the interview for this month. It's Martin Kovach from Night Shift Scale Models. And if you've seen his channel, you know what he's about. If you haven't, He's a fantastic armor modeler and a fantastic videographer. So I was really excited to be able to talk to him. So that's coming up later on in the show. To kick it off, here's a quick demo on how to use some very simple products to get a really cool metallic looking effect. I start off making sure the part has been primed or painted in black. Next, I dry brush the part in a darker silver color. I'm going for a fairly good amount of coverage on it and just build up the color slowly. I want some of the black to remain, but at the same time I want it to be mostly silver. Right here I'm using Citadel's Lead Belcher, but any kind of steely gunmetal gray will work just fine. You can see after building up that color a little bit, it's highlighted the, the various details but it's also giving it kind of a steely look with just a little bit of the black still poking through. Next I sponge on a lighter shade of silver. In this case Citadel's Rune Fang Steel. This just gives it kind of a scratchy worn look. You can go as heavy or as light as you want on this. I like to concentrate around the edges sometimes. You can go as heavy or as light as you want on that sponging, but it just gives it a little bit of a scratchy, uh, beat up look. Final step is to give it a really heavy coat of Citadel's Known Oil. There may be other products that you can substitute for this, but I haven't found one that works as well as Known Oil. After a couple of coats of Known Oil, I'm finished. This is a really simple way to get a very steely, scratchy, uh, just, just well used and worn look to anything that you want to be kind of metallic. I've done this with gunpla frames, with weapons, with uh, tank tracks as the basis of the track before the weathering. There's just so many applications and it's really quick. This, this took me, aside from the the filming of it this took me about five minutes and I just used my hair dryer to dry everything between steps so keep this in mind the next time you're wanting to make something look like worn steel just a couple of colors of silver and some shade and you're in business one of the questions that I was asked over the last month regarded airbrushing or spraying clear coats uh, whether it's gloss or matte or whatever and whether it's, you know, it can be through a rattle can or through an airbrush. But the person who asked the question said, if I'm spraying a clear coat, do I need to wear a respirator? And that's a good question. And I can see why they ask that because, you know, it's a clear coat. It's clear what's, what's in it. Well, to answer the question fully, I think you have to look at what's happening when you're spraying something. Whether it's through an airbrush or through a rattle can, doesn't really matter. It's all the same. What's happening is there's a liquid in there that's being atomized through a process of being mixed with air, and that atomizes the particles, which I'm no scientist, but I know that means it makes them really, 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 really tiny. I mean, like, even smaller than that. But it makes them really small, and they're floating around the air. Now, most of it hopefully hits your model or the, the goes out the spray booth or something like that. But that atomized material, regardless of what it is, is not something you want to breathe in. Because, because it's so small, 
when you breathe it in, it can actually enter your bloodstream through your lungs. And that's not something you want. Even if it's a clear coat, it has some kind of chemical, chemical stuff to it. Acrylic, it may have, uh, it may be lacquer based, it may be enamel based, whatever. There's something in there that the highest probability is that if it gets into your bloodstream, while it may not do anything right then, build it up over a long period of time, it may create some problems. And uh, I'm no doctor, and I don't, I don't know all the problems that it can create, but I think it's safe to say, if there are any, we want to avoid them. The best way to avoid it is to wear a respirator. Now, by respirator, I don't mean one of those masks that everybody's wearing because of COVID. That's not sufficient. While it may help us in what we're facing today in the world, in terms of atomized particles, where you're sitting there surrounded by uh, the, the stuff coming out of the airbrush or coming out of the rattle can, it's not sufficient. What I'm talking about is something that looks kind of like this. This one is from 3M. Um, there's a lot of different manufacturers around the world. There's a lot of different types, but it's, it's specifically designed for painters and it's gonna filter out the kind of particles that we're concerned about when we're airbrushing. Now, this one's a little older and I need to replace it. I've got a new one actually sitting back there waiting to be unboxed. And you do need to replace them with frequency. Either this is one that's kind of a throwaway. You don't replace the filters. I got a new one that's a faceplate that I can replace the filters on. Either way, you need to replace them at some frequency. Look at the manufacturer's recommendation for that. But that's the kind of thing you need to wear regardless of what you're spraying. Doesn't matter what it is. Even if you're standing outside and it's a nice day and there's a slight breeze and you're spraying your rattle can on your model, wear your respirator. It doesn't hurt anything to wear it. There's much more problem going to be ahead for you if you don't wear it. So, like everything else nowadays, wear your mask. Another question I was asked over the month was essentially, what is this non oil you keep talking about? It's N-U-L-N oil, non oil. It's a, what's called a shade from Citadel. It's kind of like a wash. If, if you're more of a traditional modeler, if you've not been working in the, the 40K world or something like that, it's very similar to the oils and enamels that we use on airplanes and armor and things like that, but it's acrylic. The purpose is about the same, to, to add shadow to your recesses and your panel lines and things like that. But because it's acrylic, it dries really fast. Now, it has some positives and some negatives that you have to take into account when you're using it. One of the positives is it dries really fast. So if you're needing to get something done, um, you can put it on and five minutes later, you're ready to go with the next step. You don't have to wait a long time like you, like you do uh, with, with oils and enamels. Now, the drawback is once you put it on, because it does dry fast, it's not something that you wipe away or blend away. So if you're needing that, it may not be the best product for it. But Known Oil and Citadel makes other colors. There's a brown one called Known Oil is black. Agrax Earthshade is brown. They've got all sorts of colors. But other companies make them too. Vallejo has a line of, of model washes and weathering products that are very similar. In fact, they have uh, some, some oil and petrol stain products that work almost exactly like Citadel's non oil. So they're great alternatives. And again, there's pluses and minuses to using them. What I would recommend is get a pot of non oil or Agrax Earthshade or something similar to those and just try it out. See how it works. See what happens when you put it on. It can leave tide marks. How do you deal with those? It's a tool that I think most modelers would find useful in their kit, I guess you'd say, but it's not perfect for every situation. Just like enamels and oils aren't perfect for every situation, the acrylic shades aren't necessarily perfect, but they give you a much greater variety of options when you're trying to finish a model 
And if you work like I do, where there's not only, you know, where I'm building the models and trying to have fun with them, but I'm trying to get it done in such a way that I can get these videos published. And so sometimes I have to look at it and go, you know, I, I'd really like to use oils here, but let me figure out how to use this acrylic product because I can get it done faster. So it's, it's great for that. It's also something that's really useful if you have sensitivities to the thinners associated with oils and enamels. Um, I, I don't know that it's, it's medically safe for everybody. Again, I think I've said this twice in this episode now, weird, but I'm not a doctor. But if that sensitivity to those harsher thinners is something you deal with, maybe take a look at it in that regard. But it's Citadel Non Oil, L U N O N U L N Oil. I can't even spell this stuff. Non Oil, and it's a great product to try, so give it a shot. This is a model I recently completed. Uh, it's from Machining Krieger. It's the 120th scale Jerry by Nito. Nido. Naito, however the heck you say it. Um, it's a cool looking kit and uh, it was a lot of fun to build. They're not the easiest kits to build in terms of the, the fit is not perfect, but with a little patience and a little sanding, everything comes together nicely. Everything was airbrushed with lacquer paints to get the camo pattern. And then I used a variety of oils, enamels, and acrylic products to weather it. I tried to go a little light on the chipping. Uh, too, too often I get a little heavy handed with chipping and it can end up looking like chipping is the whole feature of the model and you don't see all the other stuff. On this one I tried to keep it a little more balanced and I'm happy with the result. There's uh, some pretty cool, I think, dirt effects there on the feet. And uh, I just did that with splattering different products and some dry brushing and washing. Uh, you can see that there's some streaks and stains and things like that. I applied an oil dot filter around the model. I did uh, various chipping with sponges and brush. I did some rust staining and uh, just a lot of different effects. But I tried to, like I said, I tried to just keep them in balance and... Uh, take advantage of all the cool features this model has. You see there's an engine deck back there that gives you plenty of chances to weather that and add rust effects. There's the exhausts, uh, the gun. Uh, the gun I actually used the same uh, technique that I demonstrated in this same episode of putting on the black primer coat and then doing some dry brushing and using non oil. Uh, to get the gun to look, uh, well, just kind of gunnish. But the only hard part of the kit, aside from just sanding down some some areas that don't fit quite as well, is just getting all of these little wires on. Uh, you kind of have to plan the build out to get them on there at a time when when it's most logical so you don't have them flapping around the whole build. So I did it towards the end, and I just used some super glue to put them in. These are the wires that came with the kit, and then these, these springs here came with it. I replaced the kit wire with some of this lead solder here, just to get a slightly thinner look for the, for the hoses and tubes there. And then this one on the front, I just kind of wrapped that together and did it like that. There's a plastic sleeve that came with it, but I thought it looked cooler without it. So I went without that. And then I stuck those little antenna on the, on the back here. They had them look like they made them a little longer uh, in the kit instructions, but as I hoped to sell this and ship this, I didn't want too much wire sticking out to create problems when somebody tried to pull it out of the package. But it's a, it's a cool looking little kit. I don't think it's made anymore, but they are available. They're not cheap when you can find them because they're not made since they're out of production. Um, but there's there's a variety of them with different armaments and workups and things like that. But why it's called a Jerry, I don't know. Uh, it's I don't know. Maybe it's named after Jerry Jerry Springer or Jerry Seinfeld. I, you got me. This is I've been the whole build. If you if you're familiar, if you're a Seinfeld fan, I've been calling him Little Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> so if you're familiar with that episode, you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, 
This was a build I did over on Patreon, a, a video exclusive video build for patrons. And uh, I think it covered five episodes. And I just went through the whole process of building and weathering this thing. But if you're looking for something that's a little different, uh, maybe something from the Machine and Krieger universe, definitely uh, keep your eye open for Jerry here. And I think you'll find that it's a, a fun build. Well, I've been doing some thinking lately, and sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes it just makes my head hurt. But what I've been thinking about lately is the notion of value in modeling. How do we see modeling in terms of value? And I don't necessarily mean that this paint is cheaper than that paint, or that this kit just on the surface is cheaper or more expensive than that other kit. But rather, I've been looking at my modeling, and, and as I kind of examine this notion, I've looked back over recent kits that I've built over, say, the last year, and I started focusing in and looking on, is there a correlation between how much money I spent, or how little, and how much I enjoyed it? And I realized that there's not necessarily a direct relationship between the two. But then as I dug deeper into it, I realized that when I start thinking in terms of if you could almost express how much fun you had per hour, maybe per dollar spent, then I think sometimes that can help us in evaluating, do I want to get this model? Now, obviously we're all modelers, and of course we want to get more models. That's just what we do. It's, it's like, even if we don't build them, we just want a closet full of models. I could go through a door right there into my man cave closet, and it's full of them. So, I'm not necessarily saying buy more models, but what I am saying is when you're looking at what models you're considering buying, think about the cost versus how much fun you're going to have. Because sometimes a $10 model can be a lot of fun and it's worth every penny of it. But sometimes that $10 model may not be a lot of fun. You know, I have I have friends that say, oh, you need to build this model or that model. It's an old model from the 80s, and man, it's so nostalgic and so fun. And I look at it and I go, I just see a whole lot of work filling seam lines and stuff like that. That's not necessarily fun. So the fact that it's a $10 model, it, its value of actual fun per modeling hour spent may be kind of low. But then on the other hand, there may be something that at first, if I look at it, and I say, well, you know, that's kind of an expensive model. But if I dig into it deeper and really look at it and go, well, you know, that is a more expensive model, but it's going to take me 40, 50, 80 hours to finish that. And those are going to be good hours spent really enjoying the hobby, really, you know, getting the most out of it. And so I think when I look at my modeling in that way, it helps me better evaluate what I'm considering buying because I'm not just looking at the cost. I saw this recently with a model I finished uh, from the Warhammer 40K universe. It's called an Archaeopter. Um, hopefully, if I remember, there'll be some links appearing somewhere up here about now to point you to that. And if I don't, well, just look in the playlists. They're there. But it's called an Archaeopter, and it looks like a Russian attack helicopter from back in the Cold War era, mated with uh, a giant mechanical bat, and, and they had, a, you know, an offspring, and it's just the coolest, weirdest looking thing ever. Now, this was not a cheap model. It was, when I pre-ordered it, it was $90. But as I looked at it, I thought, man, this just looks like it's going to be fun. And I built enough Warhammer kits, Citadel kits, to know it's going to go together well. There's not going to be any problems. It's going to be good casting. But just the look of it seemed so fun. And I saw some of the promotional photos, and it showed that there was actually a cockpit in it, which just added more fun in my mind. So when the model arrived, I started going through the parts. And as soon as I saw the parts, I said, oh, man, this is going to be cool. And so over the last month, I've been building and, and documenting the process. And let me tell you, yeah, that was an expensive model, but I squeezed every bit of enjoyment out of it I could. Now, 
Could I have found a cheaper model that I enjoyed just as much? Yeah, I probably could have. But I don't think that's the point. The point is use that thought to help you evaluate it, not just for the expensive things, but for the cheap things, for the things in the middle. How much en enjoyment am I going to get out of this? You know, if it's a $20 model and I'm only going to get about you know, five hours out of it because it's real simple and there's nothing to it, that may not be as good a value as that $40 or $50 model that you're going to get 40 or 50 or 60 hours of build time out of. You know, it's like when I used to play video games. The big question was, how much play time did you get out of it? You know, and there'd be this one game that would cost 60 bucks, and you might get 40 hours of play time out of it. And this other one, you'd spend the same amount of money and you would get hundreds of hours of play time out of it. And you're, you're like, well, you know, you have to weigh that out. Now, certainly, budget is different for everybody. You know, there have been times when I wanted that really nice model and I just simply couldn't afford it. There's times now that I look at a model and I go, I just, I, I can't afford it. I just can't do it. I really like it. I think it's going to be really fun. But I just simply can't afford it. So I'm not suggesting that you spend money unwisely. But, thinking about the whole picture. How much fun am I going to have? And how much would I pay elsewhere to have this much fun? You know, if you go to an amusement park, you may pay $140, $150 for some of them. They can be really expensive. And, you know, you may have a day of fun and that may be awesome. You know, I'm not saying don't do those things. But if we're willing to spend that much money for a day of fun, Maybe these models aren't quite as expensive when we think about we can get weeks of fun out of them. So I hope that gives you something to think about. I know it's something I've been having some deep thoughts on. Okay, this month's interview is one that I think you're really going to like. It's with Martin Kovac of Night Shift Scale Models. And if you've seen his YouTube channel, you know what I'm talking about. You know his work and you know how good it is and how much of a sense of humor and fun he brings to the narration of his videos. It's, it's, even, if, even if you're not necessarily a modeler, it can be enjoyable. I know there have been plenty of times I've sat in here and watched his videos, and my wife might be walking through to do something, to head to the laundry room, or to go out to the garage, or heading out on the back porch, and she'd just stop and listen. And there have been a couple of times she goes, this guy's really funny. And I'm like, yeah, he's... He's really interesting to listen to. So if you've not checked out his work, there's going to be a description in the link below. And if I remember, there's going to be one about right here coming up soon. But if you haven't checked out his work, do check it out. But I hope you enjoyed this interview. I know I had fun doing the interview. So with all that said, let's get to the interview. Hey, thanks for joining us today on this interview. I am so happy to have Martin Kovach here with us today from Night Shift Scale Models. You may have seen his YouTube channel. He is, in my opinion, the best armor modeler putting out content on YouTube today. And I am so happy that he's joined us. Martin, thank you so much for uh, joining me for this interview. Well, thank you, John. And hello, and also to everyone else. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, what should I say first? <laughs> uh, I, I guess, I guess, yeah, to everyone watching, and again, also to you. Um, I hope you will pardon me if I take, you know, because I figure you, most of you know that I'm not not a native speaker, so sometimes I might take some awkward breaks between words when I'm thinking about the correct one, and also if I, for any reason, sound a little bit impolite or rude it's not because i'm trying to be it's simply because i don't know the language so well so please bear with me well we will be happy to do that and, and trust me your english is is far better than you give yourself credit for so but we understand and thank you all right well let's jump right into the questions so are, are you a lifelong modeler is this something you kind of did as a kid and then came back to is it something you did as an adult tell me about your modeling history well, I think with most people, um, it's like you said, they started as kids, then they took a break, and then they returned to the hobby when they were adults. Um, with me, it was actually there was no break 
uh, in the middle. It was, I started as a kid and pretty much never gave up <laughs> on the hobby. And yeah, yeah it's something interesting. And, and you re reminded me of something when people are complaining that the hobby is dying and there are no new, no kids coming to the yeah. hobby. No one, well, I'm not, I don't think it's dying. It's just, it's, it's transforming because I can understand that the hobby is not as appealing to kids anymore as it used to be back in the day, because there are just so many new options, but I think there are newcomers to the hobby every day, Absolutely. but there are adults, not kids, yeah. but adults, because it's yeah. also, it's, it's an, it's an expensive hobby and it's slow paced. So it's more aimed towards adults. I think nowadays. Yeah, yeah, I agree that that most of the people I see coming into the hobby uh, that are new tend to be adults. Now, they may be, you know, a dad with his son or something, but I see a lot of uh, adults coming into it. And you're right. It's not when I was a kid. I remember you could get a dollar bill and go up to the store and get two models. And now you walk in with a dollar bill and there's nothing you can get. So that's a that's a, a very, very true observation. Have you always been an armor modeler or did you do more when you were younger? Well, no, it was, I think I first discovered armor models when I was 12 or 11 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And before that, it was everything I could get, you know, I started <laughs> yeah. because uh, the first model I've got uh, from my parents was, this, this is, this is uh, slightly conflicting because they are telling me they gave me a ship model, Santa Maria. Uh -huh. And and I'm convinced it was some kind of spaceship or something <laughs> because I clearly remember building a spaceship with this like huge radar on top and just yeah. uh, bor borrowing my mom's nail polish and just painting it all red. <laughs> but they don't remember it, so I don't know who knows better now. But yeah, and and then it was all kinds of stuff, basically everything I could find in a toy store. So. Battleships, yeah. air, airplanes mostly, also submarines, and then I found model cars. But those were like, it's a Czech company. It's called mm -hmm. Monty System, and they're basically snap fit kits. Mm. And they are, I think, in one forty eight scale. It's not specified on the box, but they're quite small. And mm -hmm. they have like you know steel axles, chrome parts, and you don't need any glue or any paints. And there are no water slide decals, just regular transfers or stickers mm -hmm. yeah clear mm -hmm. stickers yeah. and they were amazing because you could build them in an hour you know and play with them or even combine parts from different models together so this is what i was what i was doing for most of my childhood and then um i had a friend a schoolmate who was also a modeler he was building exclusively aircraft from, from revel mm -hmm. and then one day he told me he built he bought a tank and I was like, oh, my God, a tank. That's so cool. I didn't even realize something like that existed. And, well, it wasn't a tank. It was an SPG, but that's a small detail. And Yeah. Yeah. And basically, um, I, if you saw the video I did on the T90 from Revel, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't go easy on Revel. <laughs> and No. The, <laughs> because, because it's true. On, I, I, I agree. And, I, I agree. And, and, and it's also because I have this childhood grudge against Revel because <laughs> yeah, but but not because the quality I mean back then there wasn't anything better than Revel and it was because this friend of mine my classmate uh he was like Revel elitist you know so <laughs> when I when I discovered armor models I actually visited my first real legit model store mm -hmm. and I bought uh some tanks from Italeri. Is that mm -hmm. how we pronounce it in English? It is about and, eight different ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, and, and he mocked me that, that it's not a revel that I'm, I'm building, uh, that I'm buying subpar models. And he, he, he was right in a way, <laughs> but the irony was on him because most revel kits in 135 scale are reboxed Italeri or Zvezda or whatever <laughs> crappy brands. So. Yeah. So, but 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 yeah, me and Revel, we have a long, ugly history together. <laughs> yeah, I, I it's, remember, it's personal, actually. Yeah, so. I remember as a kid, 
I was very much a monogram builder. I built mostly aircraft. I'd like you, I built a lot of things and I built mostly aircraft and I stuck to monogram. And when somebody like at my Christmas or birthday would give me a Ravel kit, I was always going, ah, not that one. Yeah. Cause it's, they're, they're not always, they're not the worst, but they're not the best. <laughs> they're leaning slightly more towards the worst. Yeah. Spectrum. <laughs> yeah. So you've really been modeling armor your whole almost your whole modeling life basically yeah yeah but it, it, yeah but back in uh, i'm already starting to sound like a boomer and <laughs> but back in my day <laughs> there, there were no magazines there were no pre-made weathering products well okay there were magazines like one and yeah. it was it was sort of like a wild west of weathering and pretty much the yeah. whole armor modeling in slovakia and czech republic uh I mean, we are separate countries, but we are still kind of intertwined together. We have yeah. almost the same language, so it's always Slovakia and Czech Republic. And yeah, I remember buying my first magazines and there were just some local guys trying stuff like how to make rust. Well, you mix rust with PVA glue. There you go. Yeah. And then there was the first I there was the first article from Miguel Jimenez and he was I mean, the results were day and night, but at the same time, he was using his own products, MIG production stuff, yeah. and uh, you couldn't get it here. So at one on one hand, I was amazed and inspired, but on the other hand, no, no, no luck for me. You didn't have any of the tools. Yeah, exactly. You, you were you were inspired to do something, but you didn't have to do it with. Well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah I hadn't thought about um, the availability there because, uh, you know, I think it's been available here much longer, but I do remember modeling as a kid and seeing there was this one model shop and there was a magazine. And I thought the magazine was just for grown men because they would stand in there and they would argue about, you know, what color should be on a FW 190 or something. Yeah. And they would look at these magazines and I saw these cool pictures, but I thought, Oh, well, kids can't buy that. I don't know why I thought that, but I thought, well, kids can't buy that. And, but I remember them talking about taking chalk, and doing stuff with it and yeah. thinning down paints and using glue and, you know, just all sorts of things that I look back and think, God, those guys probably would have gone nuts if they'd have seen what, what was available now for weathering products, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> all the uh, social media presence and everything we have now, the availability of tutorials, videos, yeah. you name it. Um, on one hand, it makes it easier to learn stuff more quickly and everything. But on the other hand, I feel like it might seem um, intimidating to yes. newcomers because because when I was starting, there was no no one who can I can com uh, compare myself to. And now when people see all those amazing models and they're like, okay, well, I think I'm not going to be able to do that. So maybe I just, maybe I just rather pick something completely different than modeling. And yeah. also the oversaturation of information on, on, online feels like for, for many people, it's actually more difficult to search in, to, to yeah. look up information than it was back in the day, because there, there's just so much of it. And yeah. it, it, it can, it can, it can, it can seem overwhelming and I can totally understand why. Yeah, I, I agree because, I mean, you you don't want to be snobbish about what you know, but there's, I mean, we all look at the same YouTube and there's times that I look at stuff that's out there and I go, man, that's some awful advice, you know, yeah. and, but if you're new, you don't know how to sift through it. I mean, that's one of my biggest fears, you know, is don't say anything stupid. Don't say anything stupid, you know, <laughs> and, and sifting through it can be, can be really hard. Um, what well, you talked about, we've talked a little bit about magazines and I know you had previously, I've seen it in your videos and I think you and I had talked about it at some previous time about you were doing work in magazines. Yeah. Um, what magazines did you, did you do work for? Uh, what, you know, how long ago was that? What were the magazines? Pretty much most of them, I think. Um, no, I'm, I'm not blowing my own, my own trumpet right now, but All right. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it was a lot of different magazines and, when I'm trying to to remember when was the first time I, for the life of me, I can't remember. I know what was the first model, but I don't even have photos of it anymore. I don't have oh, the yeah. model. I sold it on eBay. So, but yeah, the first time was in a Czech magazine, mm -hmm. and 
then it was later uh, when I was asked by a, a foreign publisher to if if I have if I had an article for a model, and I didn't. I only had finished mm. photos, and I I told him, but I don't have any step by step photos. I published the whole progress on modeling forms. Mm. He, was, he was okay with it, and so yeah, that was my first published magazine uh, article, and I think it was. Uh, I can't remember what magazine it was. There's so oh, many. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no there, there's not too many, but it was just too long ago. I think like 12 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. So almost terrifying when I said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 When you start, when you start, it's like when I, when I talk about modeling as a kid and I tell somebody when I modeled back in the last century, <laughs> it makes you feel old. So, so you've been publishing and writing and taking photos for more than a few years now. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of, when, when you're publishing, it kind of grows on you to document every single or not, not every single step, but those steps mm -hmm. you deem to be important or interesting. So yeah, I, I think it, that kind of tra translates into video production as well. Well, that's, that's a perfect segue because my next question was going to be what prompted you to get into video? Um, what, you know, were you just sitting there taking photos and writing your article and you, you thought I need to be a YouTube star? <laughs> or, <laughs> how did, how did that work? <laughs> I talked about it briefly in my uh, thank you video for 100k subscribers. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was inspired by a friend of mine, Carlos Mendes, who mm -hmm. was a YouTuber. Yeah. He, he's not uh, publishing uh, videos anymore. Um, and yeah, I kind of learned that he's a YouTube modeler. And for me, that was something amazing because when I saw his videos and all the comments, mm -hmm. Uh, underneath them and how he was uh, talking to people like he had the instant feedback and he could yeah. just talk with people about it and I thought like oh my god this is amazing he has this <laughs> awesome community of people and they're just hanging out together well it's still in the comment section so it's not you know next level yeah. hanging out but it, it's still it, it still is uh, interaction with people and yeah, I really liked that. And when I was watching his, I, I watched all of his videos and I thought, oh my God, this is so amazing. You can talk about anything you like. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, people might not watch it if I, if they don't see, they, if they don't consider it interesting, but it's your platform. You can share anything yeah. you want. And magazines, they don't give you that freedom, obviously, because mm -hmm. they're printed media, uh, they're, they have limited space, and also the publisher needs something specific, not just you rambling about stuff. And because of this, um, writing articles kind of became a little bit monotonous for me. Like It was mm -hmm. the same formula for every single article. I was trying to change it up a little bit, trying to be funny, uh, here and there, but trying to be funny in magazines is even more cringy than trying to be funny <laughs> on YouTube. So, <laughs> and a lot of time the editor, he just edited it out. So <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's, I've, I've got fr other friends who write for magazines and they, they've said, you know, sometimes they'll slip in a really funny line. And then when they see it in publication, it's been edited out and they're like, why do I even bother? So yeah, well, well, but but maybe it was for the better because when you're trying to read it when it when it's been published, it just doesn't true. flow as cool yeah. as you thought it would. Yeah, and, that's, that's true. Yeah, and and pretty much the breaking point was, was when I was finishing this. I don't like to use those fancy terms, but super detailed model. Yeah, I, I think it, it it was super detailed because I spent mm -hmm. like eight months just building it, and when I was when I was, when I was uh, moving towards the finish line, I already was thinking like, okay, this, this is going to be the last model that I'm going to publish mm -hmm. and I'm going to try making videos. Cool. But, but at, at that moment, it was just an idea like, okay, I'll build one model, film it, post it there and we'll see how it goes. Maybe people mm -hmm. won't give a flying, you know what about it, <laughs> or there will be some interest. And if so, I might do another model and we'll see, I'll, I'll just try it. Well, well, it was basically like taking a break from publishing, basically. And, well, it kind of 
to cough. It it did. I, I remember, I, I think I encountered your channel on maybe the second ball tank video. So it was very early on. It must have and, been because, yeah, I published the first two videos simultaneously at the same day. Yeah, somebody sent yeah. me a link to that, to that second one. And uh -huh. I watched that and then I watched the first one. And then I went and I looked at your channel and I'm thinking, okay, this guy's going to have a whole bunch of videos because your your video was so well shot, so well paced. It, it looked like somebody who had done dozens and dozens and dozens of videos. And when when I, I had just started recently doing videos myself, and when I saw those were your first two videos, I was so depressed. I mean, not <laughs> because of you, but I thought, wait a minute, this guy comes out like this and mine look like that. Your, your videos came out really good and they really made a stir. I remember on social media, people going, hey, have you seen this guy Night Shift? Have you seen Night Shift? I mean, it was Dude. it was hey. everywhere. So did, had you, you hadn't previously done video, had you? Uh, I mean, did they really? Because I felt like they kind of flew under the radar, <laughs> and it was the it was the next series with the Sharpie one when I suddenly found people sharing those videos and everything. Well, but... it was it was I, I I had I had a lot of people messaging me on Facebook saying, "Have you seen this guy? Have you seen this guy?" So you may not have. I mean, maybe it, when you saw it, it had built up to that, but you uh -huh. made you made a you made a stir. When you dropped those first videos, people started noticing it. So, but you you hadn't done video before, had you? Well, I mean, I I did. Oh, okay. But, but uh, let me just say the, those first videos, basically the whole Char the whole ball tank series, and also the Sharpie one, they are not really that good. <laughs> I mean, they are terrible. They are terribly paced. Um, there are long, awkward breaks between me talking because I didn't know what I was what was I supposed to say, and I wanted to keep the videos in reasonable length, not too <laughs> short, you know. And they were also awfully filmed. I mean, the camera settings I was using, all automatic white balance, all the uh, exposure compensation stuff like this. The, the color is changing all the time in those videos and. And everything, and yeah, the well, narration is just is just so well, bad. <laughs> I will say this: I think every artist is more critical of their work than anybody else. I was really impressed with it, <laughs> and I thought, okay, if this is the start, I can't wait to see where it's gone. And uh, you, you obviously, people really like it because you recently hit the hundred thousand subscriber mark. Um, in fact, I checked yesterday evening before. Uh, before we got started, and you had gone over 116,000 subscribers. When you started, did you think, okay, in a little, little about a year and a half, I'm going to beat 116,000 subscribers? Did that ever cross your mind? No, no. <laughs> I, I mean, when I was starting the channel, I I saw there are other ch channels as well. There was Luke Towen, Plasmo, mm -hmm. Panzermeister, and well, I, I knew I, I I'm never gonna be big as Luke Towen because he's he's doing <laughs> civilian dioramas which are more appealing to wider audience, and military models yeah. are quite niche, and so so military modeling channel is basically a niche inside the niche, so yeah. the audience is very small. But no, I never expected to even pass one hundred thousand. I was when I was looking at Panzermeister back then, he was at about 25,000, now it's 46 or so. Mm -hmm. and I thought, okay, maybe in a few years that could be possible, maybe. But yeah, I, I had no ambitions because, I mean, I think it's uh, it's not the best approach to start a channel with the goal of making it big because, yeah. because from the start, you're going to look at it as a basically like a spreadsheet and just you'll be just counting counting numbers views mm -hmm. subscribers and it's not not about that you know yeah 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 but i bet when you hit that hundred thousand subscriber mark you were probably thinking oh my gosh <laughs> well no, I mean, you saw no, it coming. no, no. You yeah saw i, I saw it coming yeah you know, exactly but, and, but it, it you know it, it it i can imagine it must have been to to look back and and go well, it it was it was more like it was it was more like I opened up the YouTube Studio app on my phone. And I saw it and I was like, 
feels good man <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there's, there's got to be a smile there when you of course i i noticed you were mentioning luke tau and i, I noticed recently yep. he went over a million and yep. I, I i can't imagine to open that same app and look at it and go yeah that's a million right there <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> Yeah, because because when you think about it, it's it's not not such a huge difference if you're at nine hundred ninety nine thousand and yeah. one million. So, but yeah, it's nice to have. Yeah, it's, it's to nice to see number. those round numbers like that. Yeah, exactly. Well, as of January, you also started as a full time content producer. Um, and when you when you I know you didn't just make that decision on Snap one day. But when you were considering that and you maybe started telling friends and family about it, did they look at you and say, are you nuts? You're, you're going to you're going to make a living doing what or were they you know, were they supportive? Were you worried about it? How did how did that kind of evolve? Well, no, they don't ask me if I'm nuts. I think that most <laughs> people know I'm I am. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was no surprise. But um no, it was actually, how should I put it? Um, well, friends, really good friends. They were, they were, yeah, they were enthusiastic and supportive. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, is this really happening? Did you, did you ever dream about it? And, yeah. but, but with, with, uh, family, yeah, they were happy. I mean, my closest family mm -hmm. and the rest of the family, when they heard about it, they were sort of like, okay, I didn't hear it. Like. No, I, I'm pretending. I'm pretending I didn't hear it. For maybe, maybe it looks weird to them. Maybe it looks like I'm, yeah. you know, wasting my life away. Or, or, or yeah. I don't. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I don't care. As any, so yeah, because yeah. I guess I guess if you're telling, you know, somebody says, "What do you do?" And somebody says, "I'm a plumber." And somebody else says, "I'm a baker." And say, "What do you do?" I play with plastic toys. I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, exactly. I'm thinking, who doesn't want that job? <laughs> I'm, there was this one situation when I was uh, this year. I was changing doctors because it, it's, it's different than the, in the US. You have family doctors or some something like that, and here mm -hmm. we have a childhood doctor and then adult doctor. So, mm -hmm. And so my ch my childhood doctor, uh, I was there for until I hit twenty nine years. Mm -hmm. so, from zero to 29 years and then uh, this year i had to change doctors so i was signing up to my new doctor and he was you know some writing some information about me and what's your job i said well self self-employed could you elaborate well i'm a youtuber and so okay i'm gonna i'm gonna note a self-employed <laughs> <laughs> you probably thought okay whatever <laughs> yeah exactly yeah well i i tell you what i'm I am happy for you that you were able to do that because Thank you. you're really passionate about what you do and it, it comes through. It's fun the way it comes through. So I'm as a consumer of your videos, I'm glad that you're doing it full time um, because the content has just increased in in how good it is and the quality of it. And if thank you, if you're not. If you're not supporting Martin on Patreon, um, there's going to be links in the description below. I, I'm one of his supporters. I will admit I'm one of his supporters and I love getting the daily updates and the photos. And if you think the videos are fun, getting an inside look into it is, is even more fun. So I'm plugging your Patreon there. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm mean, your patron as well. Uh, thank you, you were, you were in fact, one of my first patrons and I immediately signed up for your patron. As well, well I, patron I appreciate as well. it. I do appreciate it. Now, in watching your videos, you use a wide range of products. You're you're not you're not tied down to any one manufacturer. You use a wide range of them. But even with all the different products that you have, is there is there something that's not currently available that you wish, man, I wish I wish somebody would make that product? Hmm. I'm not sure if I'm if I should say something, because maybe some manu manufacturer will pick it, pick the idea up and <laughs> release it under the radar or something. But no, I mean, um, I, mo most people who are watching my videos know that I don't like dry pigments. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing that pigment, dry pigments are superior 
compared to anything else. And that's when you apply a gloss varnish over them, like enamel gloss, wet effects, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, the pigment will turn darker and mm -hmm. because it absorbs the, the liquid. And it looks... It, it's it's the most realistic depiction of dust with mixed with water that you can achieve. Mm -hmm. it, it pretty much looks like the real thing. And mm -hmm. no other paint can do that. Enamels, no way. Acrylics, partially, when they're super flat, like Tamiya, they can. But it's not completely up there. And if someone made an enamel paint that can change color, you know, if you apply gloss over it, that would be just... Mwah. Amazing. That would be perfect. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. I mean, because just this question just popped into my head. Have you ever thought about releasing your own products? No. It's not something you want Why? to do. Huh? <laughs> Why? I mean, the market is so oversaturated. That's true. That's yeah. true. That's true. That's true. Well, let's talk about your subject selection. I mean, yes, you're you're sticking within the armor genre, but your subject selection is not just the same old stuff. Um, you do some interesting stuff. When you're picking that, do you do you look for photos that inspire you and then look for the model? Or do you find a photo or do you find a model and go, oh, I think that's cool and go find the photos? What what drives your subject selection? Most of the time it's I find a photo and I like the idea and think like, yeah, this could make an interesting model. So then I buy the kit after aftermarket if it's needed and stuff. But I, I've been doing stuff like this most of the time most of my life no my life but my modeling career if we can call it yeah. that yeah uh, because a lot of a lot of good models just start with an interesting idea and it's one of the worst things if you buy a model that looks interesting on the box art and then you start looking up some references for it and you realize there's just nothing this yeah. vehicle it wasn't photographed that much or you can't even weather it if you want it, if you want it to look somewhat plausible. And th then what, you know? Yeah. But yeah, there were some occasions where I just bought the model on an impulse, mostly when I was on the modeling show. No modeling yeah. shows this year, obviously. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, on the other hand, it's a lot of time, it's the same stuff over and over again like weathering techniques, even the construction techniques. So I feel like for any modeler, it's it's kind of a good idea to, you know, try something else on every model. Like maybe, yeah. okay, this one will be muddy. The next model will be dusty. This one will be completely battered and stuff like that. So, yeah. And, and if, it, if it weren't for YouTube, I think I'd be building the same, basically the same models over and over again because i really like soviet armor and mm -hmm. cold war armor mm -hmm. and yeah most of my models would just be russian green and <laughs> that would be it <laughs> yeah but, but with youtube you 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 kind of need to or you don't need to but it, it's it's a good idea to keep the content uh slightly very varied so basically if you build something soviet the next model should be or it's a good idea to make it, I don't know, German and American, you know, just, yeah. just change the, not only the nationalities, but also the scale, the era, and mm -hmm. also the color scheme. So it's, yeah. it, it gets kind of boring when you build, I don't know, three uh, gray model or <laughs> green models in a row. So because basically yeah. the same techniques. So yeah. Yeah, it is interesting how YouTube changes subject selection because i've i've i do that i i look at what i've planned to build in the future and i kind of try to spread them out so there's you yeah. know mostly sci-fi is what i do and there's there there's okay let me do a gundam let me do a warhammer then let me do 40k and let me do something blue and let me do something green let me yep. yeah so that, that it does youtube drives it as much as anything that's 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 totally. interesting and, and and yeah some people might uh criticize this but f f like they, they might think like okay so youtube is you know commanding you what to do or you're letting people tell you what to do but now it's it's, it's not like that because uh it's one thing if you enjoy it but 
if no one else enjoys it because you're doing the same stuff all over again, then what's the point, you know? Yeah. You might as well just be building it for yourself and not even, you know, wasting your time with videos, with every, with filming and editing and everything. So, but, yeah. and, and also, also it's good because sometimes it was um, when I was picking up the tiger, I didn't really feel like doing it. Mm -hmm. But I felt like, okay, Tiger, people might enjoy this and it's going to be super yeah. weird. So it might stir up some uh, discussion. Yeah. And suddenly I was midway just building it and I was ha I was having a blast. And I was like, okay, this was a good choice. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it can actually influence you in a good way. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean with that. Now, let's talk a little bit about technique. Is there a particular, I mean, we see what you do. So we know what you do. Is there a particular technique or method that you're not really comfortable with? Uh, something that, you know, maybe you don't do on camera or that when you do, you feel like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of on the edge on this one. Well, I wanted to say that I wanted to say that I'm good at everything, but <laughs> Lincoln, Lincoln already stole that joke from me. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, no, I mean, my, uh, the stuff I do is very limited. So there's a lot of stuff you're missing out if you're just building armor models. Mm -hmm. And basically, I was also avoiding scenic bases and terrains for the longest time. And now I'm just discovering how many new interesting techniques are there. And yeah, there's just so there are just so many of them, and some of them are very easy, like sprinkling sand on a piece of clay, and mm -hmm. some are really advanced, like using epoxy resins to make water and avoiding air bubbles and dust getting trapped in it while it's drying and stuff like that. So I'm not even trying to attempt something like this. And for now, yeah. And yeah, but speaking of armor modeling techniques, I think most of them are that I'm not comfortable uh, with them, yeah. except maybe pin washes mm -hmm. and chipping. That's yeah. something I can completely turn my brain, brain off and just do it on autopilot. I, everything I, else, it's it's I, I need to be focused. Mm -hmm. uh, pay attention to what I'm doing, and most of the time, some of the things just don't even turn out the way I want it, like wet, like dust and mud weathering. Basically, they never turn yeah. out as I imagined them. So, yeah. well, and and I I find that interesting because in talking with other modelers, especially creators, you know, we who watch videos see it and go, "Wow, you're doing exactly the way I want to do it." And it's interesting that almost every creator I talk to says, I'm not comfortable with it. I wish I could do it better. It's something I'm always working on. And I always find that to be encouraging to me yeah. that when, when I'm, when I'm trying to do something and I'm thinking I I'm not doing well at this, people that I admire and respect are going, I, I'm still struggling with it. So it kind of, it kind of makes me feel good. Now I will say if I could go into that place in your brain that is where you're chipping method is stored and I could do copy and paste into my brain, I would so totally do that because <laughs> I absolutely love your chipping. I have watched you do it on every chipping video you've ever done and I have tried to do it and yours looks like chipping and mine looks like a middle-aged fat man who's losing his hair is painting a plastic toy. So I will say you're chipping. I agree with you. Your chipping is, is spot on. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I can offer you some advice. Maybe people will find it uh, also sure. interesting. Anytime you're not happy with your chipping, it's too big, too blotchy, or just looks awful. Always try the toothpick trick. If you can, yeah. if you start rubbing it away, those Vallejo paints that are very rubbery, so, mm -hmm. so they sort of they don't wipe off, but but they peel off, mm -hmm. and that creates awesome results. And I'm and I'm using it all the time as well, like. Really? Uh, on the on the can I already talk about it? yeah on the Crusader uh, chipping, <laughs> uh, there were yeah there were a few moments when I kind of messed up, but mm -hmm. immediately I just uh, used the toothpick and it was like well, spot on. Well, so, I, then I'm yeah. I'm gonna I've got a whole jar of toothpicks over here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna use those. Do you keep do you keep any side builds going? Something no. that's not for camera, nothing. No. No. It's all for no. camera. Everything I do, yeah, it goes on camera. So. 
Yeah. Basically, b- because because the the whole process of creating one video it takes so much time, and when you're when you're uh, doing a weekly yeah. uh, content, yeah. basically everything else just is just a waste of time for you. Yeah. So. Yeah, I can. If if, if I if I were building, I don't know for an for a magazine or whatever, and not doing it for video, then I would be all the time. I would be thinking, why am I why am I doing this and not something yeah. on camera? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, what it is. I I like to keep a small something going that's not for the camera, so okay. that if if like something is drying or, or, you know, it's at the end of the day and I can't start something new, but I still want to work. I can, okay, let me pull out this space Marine and I'm going to paint just his helmet, you know, but it's, it's interesting. When I talk to people, some are like, no, I'm totally focused on what I'm doing and others like having a little side build. And this is something I admire about you uh, because I was reading your blog when you were talking about how to build models more efficiently. Uh, so mm-hmm. I was like, okay, this is something I could use. <laughs> oh, so, thank you. Uh, so, I was, so, I was, so I was reading through it, and exactly this. When you mentioned this, I I thought, okay, that's something impressive because I can't do something like that no matter how much I try. Because the moment I start working on a model, my brain is just wired to that specific tank. Like yeah. when I when I like when I was build, starting to build the Crusader my brain was just in North Africa the whole time. Yeah. So for the yeah. life of me, I couldn't start building a winter Russian subject, you know, on, on simultaneously. So yeah. that's, that's actually a very admirable skill on your end. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I used to build a lot more than I do now. Uh, last year in 2019, I built 39 models. And it just it just wow. started it just started burning me out, and I've had to slow down. But um, yeah, I, I I if I just have one thing going, I get a little twitchy. I feel like I have to have five or six going <laughs> in just various stages. But thank you, I appreciate that. Well, it, it's a very slippery slope for a lot of people yeah. because when you start yeah. when you're building one model, and then you just can't contain your enthusiasm and you start something else suddenly you have a i don't know 10 shelf queens which you're never gonna finish yeah. because you you constantly keep opening new boxes and starting new projects and you just yeah. get distracted that, and that, that can sidetrack you yeah i mean 39 models that's absolutely i mean <laughs> because because one of the reasons i started youtube was i wanted to be more productive and weekly video that's a very good deadline to make you more productive because yeah. before that i was building two models a year if i was very lucky or yeah. when they were easy enough yeah. on, on a bad year it was just one model a year and i thought okay i mean on one hand those models are really worth looking at but on the other do I do I want to make I don't know what twenty models in my whole life until I die or go blind? Yeah. You know, so I thought YouTube would make me more productive, and on one hand it did because now I'm building I don't know five, six, seven models a year. But mm-hmm. on the other hand, it's still not much. You know, I was hoping to be like 15, 20 or something. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I I um I don't think it's possible with me to build that many models because. I don't know when, when I open the model. I I think the biggest mistake when you're when you're trying to build something fast is to look up references for the thing because <laughs> the moment you start looking at them and you spot all the details that, that are missing or can be improved, game over. No no yeah. quick model, no weekend build, nothing like that. Yeah, yeah. That's there were times when I wanted when I was building aircraft that I would come home on a long weekend and say, okay, I'm going to build this model in three days. And I wouldn't look at references. I would just go. So yeah, I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I was actually, when I, I'm still, I'm still trying uh, to be more efficient with, with mm-hmm. modeling and video making. And the latest way for me to improve this was when I was watching a documentary about South Park and I was blown away because they actually they don't make a whole season in advance and then they release it but they're making them what was the word in real time so yeah. they have they have six days for every single episode oh, it, wow. needs to, it needs to be the idea needs to be pitched on the first day then there's two days for script writing 
the next day for narration and the, la the last days for animation or something like that. So, yeah, yeah. I, and I can I, I can I can see why because they are trying. To, I mean, they are one of the most relevant TV shows, satirical TV shows yeah. to date. So they need to make episodes on the go, so they can react to stuff immediately. And I was trying to some something like that. Like, okay, this video I can do it in three days, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do it in three days. No excuses. Yeah, but. So far, it, it hasn't been working too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. Well, talking about speed, we're going to get yep. to what I call the lightning round. So you ready for okay. some quick questions? Okay, so no long answers? Yeah, if you want to give long answers, it's up to okay. you. Okay, okay. But we'll just go through them, and I'll hit them one at a time. Oils okay. or enamels? Enamels. Enamels. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Stowage or not? Um. Yeah, stowage and but but this this is a new one because if you asked me the same question a year ago, I would say no. Why, why hide all the nice details that you can paint in an interesting way? But now, yeah, I, I'm I'm sold on stowage. It's all a right, thing. all right. Chocolate or bacon? Both. I think but that's separ right. separately, separately, not not together. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> all right, one thirty fifth or one forty eight. Uh, now I feel like I'm betraying my past self because I was basically 135th elitist my whole life, but 148. <laughs> I, I, I've built I, a 135th armor kit in the past and a 148, and I liked the 148. It's, it's a good size. It's the perfect size, and it's, it's still well, de it's still detailed enough, mm -hmm. but it's just everything is about it is more time efficient yeah. and also you can you can't go wrong with 148 skill because you basically have tamia and a few hobby boss kits and yeah. the hobby boss ones they are kind of hit or miss but tamia I, I i think all of them are just perfect i mean i didn't build every one of them but i i'm expecting they're all the same quality and everything so yeah you can't I, you can't go wrong with tamia yeah, exactly. And 148 is the perfect scale. It's big enough and also small enough. And I mean, when you build a 148 scale model and then suddenly you turn to something in 135th scale, it's just like it's so huge and yeah. impractical. You know, yeah. suddenly your whole work workbench is just covered with the models, sprues, and everything. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 148 scale every day, bro. That's 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 true. Metal tracks, heaven or hell um heaven when you're assembling them that might be weird but yeah it's i mean it's so straightforward to assemble them mm -hmm. even when they don't fit and you you need to drill them out it's still just nothing special about it and mm -hmm. yeah just the, the natural sag and everything they provide heaven but paint on one hand it's easier because they're workable so even if you cover them completely with mud you can sort of break them loose and make them workable but on the other hand it takes a lot of time compared to let's say static plastic ones because the plastic ones you wrap them around the running gear and you in all all the time you know which parts of the track are not going to be visible. So the lower side where it sits on the ground, mm -hmm. the lower side of the upper run, nobody's going to see that. So why waste time with it? So in that way, plastic ones are more efficient and easier to paint. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I'd rather go with metal ones okay. over rubber ones or any other kind anytime. OK. All right. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Uh, that's probably the most evil thing people created. Like nuclear bomb, step aside. <laughs> Pineapple on pizza. I, 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 I can't imagine the thought process in someone's head when they came up with this idea. And I hate myself for falling for it when I was... <laughs> <laughs> on a vacation in Bulgaria when I was like 14, mm -hmm. uh, that was the first time I saw pineapple on pizza. It, it's called Hawaii pizza mm -hmm. here in Europe. It's also called like that in, in mm -hmm. the US. Yeah. Um, 
and I thought, awesome. And then they brought, the, you know, the plate in front of me and you had a pizza with pineapple, but it was just covered in syrup and even looking at it, looking at it was just repulsive, you know. And uh, and I took one bite and I was like, okay, this this this, this was a bad bad idea, and I'm gonna be hungry for the rest of the day because uh, it was expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll make note if we ever have pizza, no pineapple. <laughs> no, and I mean, and I mean, people have spoken because I've seen these photos from supermarket markets when. Uh, the pandemic was hitting and people were stocking up on food and there was a photo of a freezer and all the frozen pizzas were gone except the pineapple one. <laughs> that that, so that tells you all you need to know, right? <laughs> all right. Couple more. Marvel okay. or DC? Um, neither. Unpopular opinion. <laughs> but <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't really care for superhero movies oh, okay. anymore. I, I mean, I, I was excited about them when they were starting to come up like 10 or 15 years ago. You know, Iron Man and those first Marvel movies. And I think my enthusiasm was starting to dwindle when the first Avengers came out. And then when DC chimed in, that's when I just gave up on superhero movies because um, I I had I had this thing with my dad when we where we were we, where we would go to to the movies basically like father father and son, mm -hmm. and sometimes he picked the movie when he heard something on the radio. Sometimes I did, and I went with him to watch Batman v Superman, and oh, that. Yeah the most embarrassing ride home with my dad I ever experienced. I was I was feeling so bad for taking him there, making him pay for the tickets, sitting through it. I, I mean it it was it was awful. And then the final hair that broke the camel's back when was when I was watching the Suicide Squad with my friends and yeah. And yeah. that was the movie that really did it for me. Like, okay, I'm done with, with superhero movies. They, they have kind of flogged it. They have kind of flogged it a bit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Final question in the lightning round. World War II kits or modern kits? Um, again, I, I'd say both, but they have their specifics. Like, uh, I mean, for the longest time, people were thinking that if you want to do weathering go world war ii or earlier but with modern <laughs> kids those are peacetime tanks that get that get taken care of and everything like that but turns out if you look at photos it's not true it's quite the opposite and and yeah the only thing the only thing that kind of is indeed the favor of modern kids with me is how long they take to finish because usually they're quite big mm -hmm. like uh an, an abrams i don't know this big and also yeah. a lot of them are just cluttered with details yeah. so even building them out of the box takes a long time compared to let's say a mark four from World yeah. War yeah so yeah they're cool they can be weathered uh pretty in a pretty interesting way also a huge plus is that you have high quality color pictures for them like reference pictures yeah. which is amazing yeah but yeah they're more they're more time consuming unfortunately yeah. and i mean for most for most people it's not going to be an issue but again if you're if you're trying to do weekly content and you don't want to drag one model for six months it's not really feasible mm -hmm. to be yeah. as big yeah. Do you have any plans for something maybe a little different? Warhammer, wheeled vehicles, Gundam, something that you don't typically do. Do you have any plans for that in the future? Well, I mean, I can have plans, but doesn't mean they're, they will come into existence. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I do pretty much everything except airplanes, but um, it's a, it's a kind of tricky situation when you build your channel on armor models and yeah. suddenly everyone is there for armor models and i'm okay with that because that's yeah. the most interesting thing for me but if you suddenly try something else um 
I mean, a lot of people would be happy, but there also there was also a huge group that would be like, I didn't come here from for this. That's you know? true. That's very uh, true. It can be okay if you're making if you'd make one video about it, and okay if it bombs, it bombs, move on. But yeah, if you're doing a series, then you're pretty much dooming your entire channel for a month or more. So yeah. it's uh, I'm okay building mo armor models. For and and I'm okay watching you build armor models too because they're they're awesome they're awesome. Um, where do you where do you want to be in a year? I mean, do you do you have plans for where you want to be in a year? Where do you see that you're going to be? Well, in a year I'll be 30 years old, so that's depressing. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a year I hope. We'll be sitting here again and talking <laughs> the same same as right now. <laughs> I don't know. I no, I don't have any plans. I never plan too far in advance because I don't see any point in it. You just take it as it comes and and do what's exactly, what you're exactly, enjoying right now. Exactly. And if you're asking about the channel and the whole thing, um, I don't know. And one thing I can say is that I'm not taking anything anything from this for granted so yeah yeah uh, i'm always keeping in mind that the channel could in a year it could be gone maybe youtube will decide to de delete it for some reason or just the channel dies just people lose interest it can happen also patreon might be gone people just move on like yeah it i've i've supported him enough but it's time to yeah. move on so i'm not taking taking it for granted and um savoring is that the correct word yes Every moment of it. Good, so, good word for it yeah and i'm trying to do my best and with the time i have right now so um and also i'm doing everything i can so we'll be here in a year and yeah. possibly even even longer than that so hopefully well, you, yeah yeah i tell you what i'm enjoying it and i know at least 116,000 plus other people are enjoying it. So if you keep doing what you're doing, we're, we're going to like that. So um, thank you so much for taking time to, to speak with me today. I've really enjoyed it. It's, it's interesting getting these insights um, into creators and how they work and how they think. So thank you for sharing all of that stuff with us. Um, if you haven't checked out uh, Martin's channel, it's let me let me put it up here. I've got my spiffy little graphic there. Be sure and check that out. There's going to be links down below to his YouTube channel and also to his Patreon. And I, I really do urge you if you've not checked out Patreon, it's a way of supporting a creator. Um, when you go to the store, you pay for a magazine. Uh, the, the concept with Patreon is not much different. And Martin's content is worth paying for, I believe. And I would encourage you to go take a look at that and just see what he offers. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if I can chime in, it's, sure. it's the same thing with your, with your Patreon. You're oh, putting you. out a lot of uh, behind-the-scenes content and something that's just only for patrons. And I think it's a very good approach because um, I can understand that some creators, not just modelers, but any type of creator, they just set up Patreon for people to support them if they want. And that's it. That's where it ends. And I'm okay with that. But mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, some people think that Patreon is something like becoming an e-beggar, basically. And I, I can see where they're coming from, but that's one of the reasons why, at least I'm also also same with you, but I'm trying to put out as much extra content for people mm -hmm. as possible there so they they are getting at least something for their you know for their money so. yep yep that's that's it well we look forward to your coming videos and i'm enjoying what you've got looking forward to what what's coming and actually thank, uh, yeah, yeah if i can interrupt you again you were still, yeah. when you were asking if i if i if i was doing videos before youtube i wasn't able to tell you what type of videos i was doing and this is something oh, yeah. exclusive for this video <laughs> i'm going right. to say it uh, basically, uh, several years ago, I had this project with uh, two of my friends when we were uh, really enjoying uh, water pipes, you know, those from uh, the Far East, the one where mm -hmm. the, bu 
there's water at the bottom and you're smoking flavored tobacco. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And we were, it, it was our hobby. And we thought we were, because we were starting making cocktails for them, like putting fruit into the water to enhance the flavor. And we thought, well, how about we made, we started making videos about that, like tutorials. And so <laughs> we tried, it was awful and it, it, the channel does, doesn't exist anymore. So don't, don't even try searching it up. And yeah, I, I I wasn't the cameraman, but I was the editor. So okay, so so, so you had yeah. done, you had done that, and you and it, it didn't work out. And you said, "Let me try something I'm a little more familiar with." <laughs> uh, not really. It it was a mini. There's a, a long gap between those two projects, like uh, five okay. or more years. Yeah, uh, it was just something I tried. I didn't enjoy it. It was taking too much time and all of that, and. Then I stopped stop smoking again. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's that's interesting. Thank you for for sharing that because I, yeah, I, 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 I don't know that. I don't know if I just exposed myself or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. People, people are going to say, "Wow, I never knew that one." <laughs> but that's cool. Let's, Thank you. Or, or oh my, he was smoking. Let's cancel him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, <that> <laughs> cancel culture on Martin. Yeah, that's funny. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you again. I appreciate you being here and uh, wish you the best of luck in everything you do in the future. And I know you're just going to continue growing and because I know for one, I'm going to keep watching you. So thank you very much, Martin. Thank you as well, John. And I appreciate your time and these, this, this opportunity. And hopefully, hopefully we might be able to do something similar sometime in the future. Yep. Count on it. All right. Thank yeah, you very great. much. Thank you. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this last Tuesday show for September 2020. I hope you enjoyed watching it. I know I had fun putting it together, and uh, I look forward to doing next month's show. I've already gotten the interview for next month lined up, and, you know, the first one was Lincoln Wright. This, this, this one this month is Martin Kovacs. Next month, I think you're going to like the one that I've got coming next month. So be sure, and how's this for a segue? Be sure and hit subscribe down there somewhere. So you'll subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell icon so you'll know when that comes out and the other videos I release. I try to release one every Friday and it's just looking at building a model. It may be building the interior of it or assembly or getting it ready for paint or painting it or weathering it, whatever. And I just build a variety of science fiction subjects. So I hope you'll uh, take advantage of what I provide and I hope you'll get some entertainment and a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of maybe some helpful information out of it. I've also got social links down below, so if you're on any one of those social media platforms, I'd love for you to connect with me there. There's a link to Patreon. I do depend on Patreon support to be able to get the things that keep this channel going. So if you click on that link and just see what I have to offer, and if you're able, uh, I would appreciate your support. If you're already a Patreon supporter, thank you so much for that. That really does make this possible and my family and I are truly grateful for it. So thank you very much for, for standing behind us in what I'm trying to do on this channel. And finally, I'll close with what I like to say after every video. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.